All right. Um, thanks, Mary, and thanks for everybody coming down today or tonight. And Packers play at seven thirty. So I'll try to get everybody out of here way before then, so we can um, six o'clock now. So I'll try to finish up by seven or so. Um, my name is Bob Wilking, and I'm a wildlife biologist. I work full time for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Rhinelander, but kind of my hobby or second job is outdoor writing. And I've kind of freelance outdoor, been a freelance outdoor writer for um, 25, 30 years. Um, the biggest thing I guess I've done so far is some books for the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is the book that was published in 2008, On the Hunt, The History of Deer Hunting in Wisconsin. And this is working. Uh, So a little history on the, the background of the book, how it came to, to be. Um, one thing I did a long time ago was start um, writing for Wisconsin Outdoor News. And a lot of you are probably familiar with that. It's still um, around today. It's a really good publication. Comes out bi-weekly. Has a lot of good hunting and fishing information in it. It's edited by Dean Bortz. Um, it's not published in Monaco, but Dean lives in Monaco. Um, and I, I did some general articles for them, and then I had the idea, I've always wanted to talk about, I always wanted to write about deer hunting history. And what I started to propose to Dean was to write at least one article about what was it like to hunt in 1910 or 1912? You know, what kind of licenses did you need? What kind of deer population did we have then? Um, so I started that with um, the first decade, um, from 1900 to 1909, and we continued it on. It was received really well, and I ended up writing 10 pieces for Outdoor News, which covered the whole history of um, the 20th century, from 1900 to 1999. Um, and in, in doing that, I did a lot of research, more than that could be used for the newspaper, because limited space in a newspaper. And right after we did the, I did that, we talked about trying to make it into a book. And there just wasn't enough material with the articles, and we kind of forgot about that for a while. And then I saw a book by Wisconsin Historical Society Press on, um, it was a biography on Gordon McCory. And I don't know how many people, um, Gordon McCory is probably the most famous outdoor writer, and he's from Wisconsin. He wrote for the Milwaukee Journal for years in the early 1900s. And I thought, well, heck, if they're doing a book like that, maybe they'd be interested in deer hunting history. So I ran a proposal past the Historical Society Press. And at that time, they were wanting to get into more outdoor history or natural history. And the Macquarie book was kind of their first try at that. So this, was, this kind of book was perfect for what they were looking for. And um, I began working with the press in 2004. And they wanted me to um, beef the, the material up a little bit, to go back before what I had, before 1900, and to bring it up to the present day, which was about 2007 at that time, because the book came out in 2008. And as I researched the, the other part of the book, I thought I knew a lot about deer hunting history from those 10 chapters that I wrote for Outdoor News. but. When I began researching earlier and later um, from that time period, I found out a lot I didn't know. And what it really did was answer a question that I guess was in the back of my mind, but not really intended to, to answer in the book, but it did. Um, the question, why is deer hunting such a huge deal in Wisconsin? Um, when deer season comes around, especially the gun season, the nine day rifle season, you know, the, the state pretty much shuts down, and um, maybe not so much as it, it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but it's the, yeah. you know, the fall holiday for the kids to get that week off before, uh, or the week of Thanksgiving off. And a lot of people that don't understand deer hunting um, kind of ponder this question, you know, why is everybody so crazy about deer season? And I think I... I answered that question with the book in a way I didn't, didn't think um, I was going to. 
Because I went back to the beginning. Um, back to the origins of the white-tailed deer. Why do we have white-tailed deer in Wisconsin? Where did it come from? Where did the species come from? And Ernest Thompson Seton was an early naturalist, um, turn of the century, early 1900s. And he wrote in a book, the white tail is the American deer of the past and the American deer of the future. And when I found this quote, it was um, perfect for what I was finding out about white tail deer as I was doing research for the early part of this book. The white tail deer is truly an American deer. So Seton's quote, makes a lot of sense. It's the American deer of the, the past and the future. The white-tailed deer evolved in North America. It wasn't an animal that came over from Africa or Asia, like some animals did when there was a, a connection between the two continents. The white-tailed deer is truly an American deer. Early ancestors to the white tail crossed into North America from Asia, from Siberia, um, long time ago. Um, Pliocene epoch, but what that means is about five to two million years ago, is when maybe something like this deer, look, the early precursor to the white tail might have looked like this is um, an Asian deer that still exists today. So something like this came across when other animals also were kind of crossing back and forth. There is a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. And once here, a branch of these deer evolved into the white tail we know today. They stayed predominantly to the north, the northern part of North America. And it was this two to, to one and a half million years ago, the, um, the Pleistocene, which is the, the, age, the ice ages, the recurring ice ages um, that the last ice age that we experienced here in Wisconsin um, ended about 10,000 years ago. The Wisconsinian um, ice sheet receded um, back up into Canada in geological time not that long ago, 10,000 years ago. Um, and the Pleistocene before the ice age, or before the ice sheet completely receded. Um, there were recurring ice ages. So the ice, we have recent ice age, but there were ice ages throughout a couple million years that came and went. So the Pleistocene landscape had a, a lot of different animals um, you know, here in North America that are extinct now. Um, they're called megafauna. They were mostly bigger than species we have um, alive today. Megafauna is just large animals. But we had all sorts of different weird things that you wouldn't have expected that lived in North America. We had um, different species of buffalo, bigger than the one surviving species we have today. Um, but there were a lot of African type animals, or animals we think of Africa. There was a, a North American giraffe, there was um, North American lions, um, there were wolf species. The gray wolf has survived today, but there were other wolf species that didn't survive. Um, so in, in this bizarre time of, of all these different species, that's when the white tail was evolving into what the white tail is today. So there was pressure from herbivores. There were tons of different um, vegetation eaters, plant eaters. And that's what the deer was. Um, the, the origins of the deer was um, as a, a herbivore. So the, the white tail had to compete with a lot more. You know, today we have elk, you know, we have very few uh, wild herbivores as compared to, to back in this time. So that competition from all these different vegetarians or herbivores had an impact on white tailed deer, as did the variety of predators. There's um, a bulldog bear that was bigger than a grizzly bear. Um, there are several different bear species. There was, like I mentioned, several different gray wolf species. There was the saber-toothed cats that we're familiar with. And to survive, the white tail had to develop ways to 
not only compete with the herbivores, but to survive the predator. So a competition, um, like they say, nature is, is pretty tough. It's red of tooth and claw because it's not an easy way to make a living, um, especially when, when you're a deer. So competing with things like woolly mammoths, which were herbivores, and that's something I never realized before, that their main food source was like balsam um, fur and um, conifers and small plants that grew on the ground and you know, animals that big, the, the woolly mammoths and the mastodons were herbivores. And then there's a depiction of that might be a, a, a bull-faced bull or bulldog bear, I can never remember, and a saber-toothed cat, kind of what a, maybe a saber-toothed cat looked like. The dire wolf was one of the wolf species that we no longer have today, but they were bigger than a gray wolf, and they had a, a jaw strength that was many times greater than the jaw strength of a, a gray wolf, so they were pretty fearsome. This is a depiction of what the American lion might have looked like. So these, these large predators were out there, and um, all perfectly capable of killing white-tailed deer. Here's another depiction of what it might have looked like, kind of a, unrealistic that all these animals would be out there together, but the, the habitat or the landscape in the Midwest looked more like it would in, in the Arctic. It was open, you gotta remember that the, the ice sheet was not that far away and um, the glacier was um, over a mile high, so the climate was, was really cold, it was Alaska-like or, or Canadian-like, but as that ice sheet retreated, it changed the whole climate and all the habitat in Wisconsin um, and the region because the, you know, all that ice left the, the area, the region was warming up and it was drying out. As the ice melted, there are huge rivers and lakes. There's, glacial, there's a glacial lake, Wisconsin, that was huge, um, south of Lake Superior, I believe. Um, so there was a lot of water, and as the, the climate changed, as it warmed up and dried out, um, the vegetation changed and the habitat changed, and these mega animals, these um, mega fauna, were for the most part really restricted in their habitat, really restric restricted in the, the ways that they lived. So most of them went extinct. Um, we had a a giant beaver that was as big as a black bear. Um, it went extinct. And all these species went extinct in a relatively short amount of time. And some one theory is that because people came in right after this, it was over hunting, um, but most people agree it was habitat, or it was climate change that impacted the species. So to survive all the, the upheavals of habitat and environment, Um, the reason we have white-tailed deer today is because the white tail was very good at avoiding extinction, according to Valerius Geist, who's a deer researcher in Canada, at the University of Canada. So while these other species were disappearing, the white tail flourished because deer were adaptable and opportunistic and could shift to new habitats. So deer are not dependent on a, a real um, specific type of habitat. They evolved being under all this competition with the other herbivores, they evolve being um, adaptable browsers. So they don't just eat grass, they eat a little bit of that plant, a little bit of this plant, and as habitat changed, they, they adapted to it, um, which is one reason they survived. They also, with all that predatory pressure, they developed a security toolbox, is what one deer researcher put it as, um, basically second to none, and it involves superior smell, superior eyesight, and all sorts of evasive tactics, how to avoid predators. So you think about what was happening in the Pleistocene, why whitetail survived, and then take that deer and place it in our hunting situation, and you understand why the whitetail is one of the greatest challenges for hunting, especially a, an adult buck. Um, that we have in North America. 
because they have all these characteristics that make them a challenge to hunt. And I think, I can't get this going on that. This isn't real exciting video, but it, it kind of points out, here's a deer in, in my backyard on my driveway. It just points out the big ears that deer can hear really well. And the eyesight, those big round eyes that bulge out of a deer's head, they can see forward, but they can also see a long ways. Um, it's not 360 degrees, but it's, it's pretty good eyesight. They can see behind them. Um, and the, the sense of smell. Um, every deer hunter knows how good a sense of smell deer have and how important it is to be hunting downwind and not upwind. And you can't tell too much from this video or this clip, but the, the big white tail is part of the evasive tactic. When the deer bounds off into the woods and the tail flags, that confuses predators. And the idea, the behavioral characteristics, characteristics a deer have is to break contact between the predator and itself. So that's why it zigzags through the woods, that tail is going in different directions. Um, the deer knows exactly every rock, every you know, step in its habitat, but the chasing predator oftentimes doesn't know everything. So deer can really, a lot of times, avoid a predator even if it's chasing it. This is just something from last year. There's some deer down the street from my home. And this shows um, a couple things. The camouflage, the, the dappled um, hide of the fawn kind of breaks up its, its presence in the woods. Kind of looks like um, shade and, and sun um, breaks up the solid image of a deer. And Having the, the fawn be able to stay in one spot while the, the doe leaves to feed is a, a huge um, survival characteristic. And the, the fawns don't smell. They don't have a real um, scent that predators can pick up. Even though um, bears and wolves will do you know, focus on fawns in the spring, most of the fawns, fawns have a pretty good survival rate. And this shows, you know, those other fawns are eating grass. That one decided to eat some, um, some whatever that is, new growth there. So that shows the, um, how really flexible or adaptable deer are for feeding. Um, I think the one little guy still wants to, one of them wants to nurse yet, but, and they'll pick around, they'll eat some of the grass, but really what they're looking for is forbs. Um, little plants and, and they'll pick, you know, their favorites and that guy's got a favorite there. And the, you can see how alert the doe, even though she's kind of tame because she's in the neighborhood, she's always alert, you know, watching. And I guess they're too old for that now. <laughs> kind of neat that she had three pawns. So deer are always on, always have that alert behavior too. So, so really the history of deer hunting goes back to when people started hunting deer in Wisconsin or in this region. Um, the relationship between the human hunter and whitetail began as soon as man entered the scene and that was on the heels of the Ice Age about 10,000 years ago. Um, the theory anyway is that people during the Ice Age a lot of water was locked up in glaciers, so it allowed a land bridge between Siberia and, and North America. And some wildlife species went back and forth on that land bridge. And one theory, and this I'm coming up with different theories, but one theory is people entered North America on that land bridge, and then within a matter of a couple thousand years, dispersed across all of North America and into South America. Um, the Paleo-Indians is what they were called. 
and they were big game hunters. They hunted mammoth and mastodons, um, the other animals, the other megafauna that were still um, before the megafauna extinction. And they used spears, like it shows here, and a big technological advance for deer hunting or for, for big game hunting in general was the spear thrower. Um, some people pronounce it as addle addle, some people pronounce it as atlatl. -addle. It's A-T-L-A-T-L. -A -T -L. And just the invention of this little thing that people, the Palo Indians held, and then they could go back like this and swing, um, sling that spear, increased the velocity of the spear um, and, and the accuracy. Um, so it was a, a pretty big deal. And um, even today, there's some people that are kind of promote um, the ancient ways of hunting in some states allow those um, for legal deer hunting in Wisconsin. Um, so as the, the big animals disappeared and went extinct, the smaller animals became more important to the Paleo-Indian. So instead of um, going after a big prize like a woolly mammoth or a mastodon, um, white-tailed deer became um, more and more important. And archaeologists have found the remains of, of white-tailed deer bones in the fire pits of Palo Indians from eight or 10,000 years ago. So it's pretty amazing that our deer hunting tradition goes back to that far back. Um, the, it's pretty well accepted that the, the Native American um, nations and the indigenous people today that we have um, in the country are descendants of these of the Paleo Indians, but through the centuries um, and thousands of years, um, there was a lot of cultural changes. The Paleo Indian um, kind of transitioned to um, into the archaic period where um, they became less dependent on just big game, but deer hunting and other big game hunting was still important. So the archaic period hunters um, leading up to um, Native American um, nations that we have today adapted to this post-glacial, um, post-Ice Age world. And one thing I learned that the bow and arrow replaced that ladle as a weapon of choice only about 1,500 years ago, even though in Europe and, and Asia, the bow and arrow had been around for a, long, a lot longer than that, for thousands and thousands of years. So apparently that did not come across the, the land bridge. That technology didn't come across with the Paleo Indians. So kind of moving along, um, the Indians, um, the Indian relationship, I guess, with white-tailed deer changed a lot when Europeans came to Wisconsin. And Nicolay is, is credited as being the first European um, to set foot in Wisconsin. And he did this not too far from here, um, the southern end of Green Bay, where Green Bay stands today. And he met the, um, the Winnebago Indians, known as Ho-Chunk today. And the um, Menominee Indians were there as well. There was a third tribe in the state at this time, in 1634, the um, Santee Sioux that eventually um, moved farther west. But um, what this is significant for, even though Nicolay wasn't a trader, he was there to um, to look for a, a route to China, and he was also there to kind of mediate a dispute between other Indians um, for trade. But the um, the relationship of the fur trade, um, or the having the, the French arrive and, and having the Indians integrate into the, the fur trade system had a big impact on the relationship with white-tailed deer. Um, when the French, uh, Nicolet left and it was quite a while before any French traders came back to Wisconsin, but what the French encountered, the tribes in Wisconsin, um, there's a lot of things that they had in common. 
They were very good at utilizing the natural resources available in this, this region. They gathered wild rice, nuts and roots. They made sugar from maple sap. They traveled on foot or in canoes and in winter used snowshoes. The, um, the birch bark canoe was, was a real great technolo technological advance. Um, it's amazing how complex a birch bark canoe really is. And all the tribes hunted deer. Um, and deer, let's see what the next slide is. Deer were important for subsistence for the Native Americans that lived in the Wisconsin region. The whitetail provided um, lots of things. It was like a, a grocery store on four legs. Um, provided food, material for clothing, and tools, a lot of bone tools. Antlers were used as tools. Deer didn't migrate out of the region in the winter. They were here during the, the really tough Wisconsin winters. They didn't den up like a bear and sleep the winter away. And they were easily transported. They weren't a huge animal. Um, they were easy to process. Um, so deer were important for a subsistence um, use. Um, especially northern tribes, too. Deer hunting was crucial for the Ojibwe. Um, the Ojibwe kind of came into Wisconsin after French contact, being pushed from the east because of wars with other tribes. But Robert Beter, who is a, an Indian um, expert, writes a lot about Native Americans. He says, despite summer fishing and hunting, there was seldom enough food to last through the year, so autumn, winter, and spring were given over to hunting large game. Um, especially the Chippewa, or the Ojibwe, um, they would break up into their, their hunting bands in the, the fall, and they each um, family group, each band, had their own hunting territory. Um, it wasn't real you know, rigid boundaries, but they, they had to go to separate areas to ensure that they had enough game to survive the winter. Um, so that's kind of how the, the subsistence hunting went for deer. Um, after French contact, um, the Indians in Wisconsin acquired firearms, um, and that kind of is symbolic of the change. The, um, the fur trade was primarily based um, on beaver and other furs, and we're, everybody is pretty familiar with the, the European fur trade, the, the Indians providing fur to the, first the French, then the English, then the Americans, and it was based on the demand for beaver felt for hats. Um, and it was a fashion statement in Europe to have a really fine um, beaver felt hat, but it wasn't just, everybody wore hats back then in the 1600s, 1700s. Um, and the type of hat you had really determined your status, or really was, um, showed what your status in society was. Somebody with a really nice hat was, you know, a wealthy merchant or even royalty. Somebody that might have had a, a little kind of calf was um, more peasant um, related. So hats were a lot more important than we, we think they are today. Um, but secondarily to the, the beaver fur, the demand for beaver fur was deer hide, the hide trade. And that's something I didn't realize. I thought I'd do something about the fur trade. But the importance of deer hide um, can't be overestimated. It was almost as important as the beaver hide trade. Um, so this is like the first wave of exploitation of the deer herd. Of the, it's transitioning the, the Native American hunter who used deer for thousands of years for subsistence to now a, a, an economic um, goal. Um, deer hides were a sought after commodity, so they became a profitable component of the fur trade. Um, deer hides from deer killed in Wisconsin eventually ended up as gloves or shoes. Um, in one book I saw a list of the different things that were made out of deer hide, and it was hundreds of, you know, anything you can think of um, you know, there wasn't a lot of manufacturing going on back in 1600, 1700, so um, all sorts of little things were made out of deer hide. And the, the relentless North American fur and hide trade took its toll on many species, including beaver, 
but also including the whitetail. So through um, the mid 1600s to the early 1800s, whitetail numbers were greatly diminished because of this high trade with between the Native Americans and the European um, merchants. And this is just a quote I threw in from John James Audubon. He kind of laments about the, might, might be a little over the top, but for as the deer, caribou, and all other game is killed for the dollar which the skin brings in, the Indian must search in vain over the deserted country for that on which he is accustomed to feed till, till worn out by sorrow, despair, and want, he either goes far from his early haunts to others, which in time will be similarly invaded, or he lies on the rocky seashore and die. But um, there's some truth to that. Um, as beaver numbers and other fur bearers and deer were depleted, that was the, the push to go farther and farther west, which did um, kind of part of the exploration and, and founding of our country was largely based on, at least the early days, based on that. Um, but then there was a change. And one thing, oops, backwards. One thing that I realized as I was doing this research was the, the deer hunting history in Wisconsin just completely parallels Wisconsin's history, even the history of the United States, and, and then more locally, Wisconsin's history. A lot of our um, historic moments or, or cultures are kind of bound up with deer hunting. Um, so what changed for the deer, um, and deer did not go extinct, was um, the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 um, changed. The English had already beaten the, the French and they were out of the picture um, as far as the, the trade goes. But, but then after the War of 1812, we we solidified our possession of this northwest region that they called Michigan, Wisconsin, and, and Minnesota. We, there's still some hangers on with English, some of the forts here. Um, War of 1812, we got the English out. Um, so a new political situation. There weren't the European markets anymore because um, we were um, not friendly with Europe at this point in time. and. The, the high trade had already decimated the deer population, at least here, to such a degree that it wasn't profitable. Um, there weren't enough deer to make it um, profitable for, to, for the Americans to even carry on the trade. So it all but disappeared, and that led to increases in deer, again, um, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Deer populations be begin, began to make a comeback. And that was good timing for the settlers that were beginning to enter Wisconsin at this time. Um, farmers from the east and immigrant farmers began coming into the state in the, the early 1800s, 1820s and 30s. By 1840, there were 31,000 or just 31,000 um, population in the state. And it was pretty, um, pretty touch and go. Um, for the early pioneer settlers. So deer hunting was important again as for another group of subsistence hunters. It was important to um, for protein to get meat on the table and um, clothes on the kids. And, and then as the farmers became more successful and um, started having more domestic animals, the, the deer hunting wasn't as, as important as it had been for subsistence hunting. But then the deer hunting evolved into another exploitation of the deer herd, into market hunting. So market hunting was the second phase of hunting deer for money. Um, but this time it, it wasn't a colonial, it wasn't tied to fur trade or European powers, it was Americans that had no, um, were hunting an unregulated resource. There were no no bounds on hunting deer. With uh, the increase in the deer population, it was profitable, again, to hunt deer. Um, settlement of the state and um, increasing road networks could mean then that a market hunter could shoot a whole bunch of deer, 
put them in his, um, his wagon and haul them to town and, and sell them for food um, or sell the hides. Um, as railroads um, became more common in the state, then it was even easier and quicker to transport the, the venison to market. And the hides now were going to places like Pittsburgh. Um, Pennsylvania had um, huge tanneries at this time in the 1850s, 1860s, and they were primarily processing deer hides. Um, we didn't have a big the cattle um, market from out west yet. Um, so deer were providing that leather um, for the leather products that uh, were being sold in America. They weren't being shipped overseas. Um, the other thing that, that really ramped up the market hunting was after the Civil War, they invented refrigerated rail cars. So they could take meat and vegetables from, you know, for one um, part of the country and transport a thousand miles away. So with, um, with game, especially with venison, that allowed hunters in Wisconsin to ship their, sell their, their venison somewhere, and the venison got shipped to Chicago or got shipped to Minneapolis. And the market hunting phase um, was not just um, for venison, not just deer. It was waterfowl, it was um, any type of animal out there which was free for the taking. So market hunters took advantage of that and there was a big demand for wild game. This is a, <clears throat> a menu from John B. Drake's um, Drake Hotel in Chicago. And this is a special annual game dinner, um, but there's a lot of menus like this from the 1800s that feature wild game. Um, it was legal to, to sell wild game. That's what market hunting was all about. So you can see some of the things people ate at restaurants and um, three or four dishes, I think, are venison related. Um, plus about everything else you could think of. Starlings, snipe, squirrels. And there was a real big demand, um, like I said, in the, the restaurants and the, the hotels and Minneapolis was a big um, point where Wisconsin Venison went to and Milwaukee and Chicago as well. Um, so what market hunting began to do was decrease the deer population in the state. And starting with more populated areas in the southeast, you can see by 1887, there were, according to this map, there were hardly any deer or no deer in the southern counties. Um, deer were still present in central Wisconsin and northern Wisconsin. Um, in northern Wisconsin um, was actually becoming good deer habitat due to the logging. Um, another form of pretty intense resource exploitation, the, the, um, the, the white pine, or the, the pinery of the north with the white and red pine, um, were being harvested at enormous rates. There are billions of board feet coming out of the north central and northern Wisconsin, about Stevens Point, um, up north and following the, the major river drainage systems is where most of the pinery was. And it was another thing where that was unregulated. Um, the, the lumber barons were taking advantage of the resource and they were just cut and get out. Um, kind of the same thing with the market hunting for, for wildlife. They would cut, make their money, and then they'd move to you know, it slowly went to, to Minnesota, then it skipped over to Washington, Oregon. Um, so from the, the mid to late 1800s, we are cutting down all the pines, which was providing really good deer habitat. Because in the, the old growth pine didn't allow a lot of understory. And we know now whitetail um, were adaptable, but they, they need the, um, the forbs and the bushes and the, the understory. And after all the trees were cut down, we had acres and acres of cutover. It was all of northern Wisconsin was cut over. Um, so that was everything growing back up, the, the brush and um, small trees being regenerated, perfect white-tailed deer habitat. So the, the destruction of the pinery or the harvesting of the pinery was a real help for deer populations and they began to increase up north and as they were decreasing in central and southern Wisconsin. Um, 
So about kind of the same time, market hunting, you can see on the left with waterfowl, that was um, just decimating our wildlife populations. And, and the, pine, the cutting of the pineries was, is another example of this unregulated harvesting. So late 1800s, um, there became the era of the modern sport, hunt, sport hunter kind of um, transition from all this destruction. People like T.R., Theodore Roosevelt, um, Gifford Pinchot, the, the first head of the Forest Service who was buddies with um, T.R., they developed, they established the Boone and Crockett Club and their objective, they realized that we would have no um, resources left if it wasn't regulated. Um, so this was the beginning of the conservation era um, and it came on the heels of this unmitigated um, hunting and um, you know, people at this time expected all the, the wildlife in the country to go extinct. They just thought, we'll take advantage of it. When it's gone, it's gone. But the, this other idea that you could conserve it for future generations really took hold. And this is where we transition into the deer hunter as a sportsman. Um, the sportsman was realizing that deer or hunting deer for recreational purposes, realizing that they enjoyed hunting deer. They weren't hunting for to make money. It wasn't their occupation, like the market hunter. And they weren't necessarily hunting for subsistence. Um, most deer hunters were um, coming from southern Wisconsin. They were, they were farmers or they were merchants. So the idea became to protect the deer herd so it could be a resource to be enjoyed. And this is where we see the origins of the deer camp tradition in Wisconsin. The deer were up north. The southern counties still had few to little deer. So by necessity, if anybody wanted to hunt deer in the late 1800s as a sportsman to take a couple weeks off and, and hopefully get a nice big buck, they had to go north. Um, so they hopped on the train at the closest, you know, southern or central Wisconsin rail, railroad station, and most of the the lumbering the lumbering towns like Rhinelander and Hayward, um, they had rail service by this time. So hunters would um, reach the north woods by rail. There was no road infrastructure or anything like that. So, by doing this, they weren't going to go up there for a couple days and hunt. Um, the season was generally two weeks, even back then. And when they, they decided they were going to deer hunt, they were up there for the duration of the hunt. So they had to stay somewhere. I can turn this off again. Um, so a lot of old logging camps became deer camps. Um, like that last picture showed, the, the train would stop and let people off wherever they wanted to go. And there were a lot of abandoned logging camps by this time. A lot of the hunters would just build little log cabins. Um, it was pretty open country. There wasn't much issue with private land ownership or anything back then. So um, some hunters would bring up tents, canvas wall tents and things like that. Um, so this is the, the origin of the deer camp tradition that we still have today. Um, a group of hunters would go up and spend two weeks generally together in a camp and hunt deer. And one thing I always like to point out on, on these pictures from the, the turn of the century is when you think of the cameras that were used then, um, they weren't you know little snapshots. It took a long time probably to, to organize this photo and they all had to stay still because um, any movement would have been blurry and so it seems like they get their best clothes on and they all have their guns and they posed all the deer and they're just really neat old photos. And definitely proud of the, the meat pole. And of course these are black and white, but I, I'm guessing nobody had blaze orange. <laughs> or maybe they had red on, but um, this is a deer camp that 
supposedly was close to Rhinelander where I live. Um, there's a Gudegas Creek just outside of. What kind of dog is that in that picture? I don't know. Is that a pointer? Maybe some kind of hound. Did they, did they have to have hunting license back then or not? Yeah, there, there actually was. Um, there was. They had to have a paper tag and they had to um, tag their deer. I think a hunting license cost, I think at the beginning, when they first, they first started issuing them in the late 1800s, like the 1880s, and they were like 50 cents and they went up to a dollar. And it wasn't a license per se, it was a piece of paper that they had to tag the deer with, um, kind of like a transport tag. Just like we do with the... Like we used to do with our tags, like in the years, like when you put them to register them. Yeah, it was just like that because the um, that way um, there were hardly any wardens at this time, um, but that way they knew they um, they knew that you had paid your your hunting license fee, your dollar or whatever. Um, some hang the deer this way around, and some hang them the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this is definitely if you got big horns on them, you want to hang them this way. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, there's photos that have just enormous bucks, you know, and um, definitely worth going up north for. And you can see the, they had a little canvas tent there. Um, some pictures, we don't have a lot of, huge number of pictures in the book, but sometimes you see pictures of one of those canvas tents that would hang, hang a string from a tree and, and just spread out this kind of cone-shaped tent, and they'd have five or six guys sleeping in them you know, for deer season, so it was pretty, pretty rough. <laughs> um, this is just a quote from John Madsen, wrote a book about white-tailed deer back in the 1960s, and this sums up um, what we know today, um, people that enjoy deer camps today, that there's more to the deer camp than just a place to hunt deer from. There's a lot of camaraderie and, and just the, the things that go on at deer camp, the fun things is, are sometimes more important than the, the hunt itself. And, and there are a lot of dogs in pictures back then, and they probably used them for hunting. Um, one thing, I don't usually talk about this in the presentation, but the, the development of regulation was kind of haphazard at the beginning. Um, counties would pass their own deer hunting regulations, so it was impossible to enforce. And a few counties started passing regulations against the use of dogs. Um, and it wasn't until later, towards the turn of the century, where the state um, hired the state began making statewide um, regulations and they hired, the first wardens they hired were kind of um, hacks or of the, the governor. They were just kind of a, um, a position that, that didn't do a lot of enforcing. But later on, um, they did start a conservation department and they did, um, hire wardens that were effective. Um, so we see this regulation start at the turn of the century in the early 1900s that pretty much put an end to the market hunting too at the same time. Um, Downstate hunters took deer home by rail um, and this was not very, um, the, the northern cities like Harshaw, which is just west of Rhinelander, um, the, the population in the north didn't like this. They didn't like seeing all these hunters because everybody that wanted deer hunt came up north now and they didn't like seeing the, the train stations or depots stacked full of deer. And this is nothing compared to, I've seen pictures where there's um, you know, 100 deer at the depot waiting to go south. You know, so there were deer in northern Wisconsin, but it wasn't like there were millions of them either. And, um, this kind of started a rift between North and South <laughs> that may still be going on today. Um, so, as I'm talking about regulation, um, this is game laws from 1927. 
game laws became more standardized and, and stringent. Um, hunter numbers continued to grow, though. Um, so kind of this, this rift between the north and south of the, the northern population, northern people not liking the southerners coming up and taking their deer, um, we began to see deer populations go down in the north too, and, and this kind of led to uh, sentiment um, for saving the deer. Um, and it, it's in combination with the hunting, with the, the state of the deer population in the south too, as more and more counties lost their deer populations from the, the market hunting and unregulated hunting, um, and the north was um, seeing their deer numbers decline, or at least they perceived it, there was this save the deer um, push that started in the early, um, in the 20s and, and 1930s. So those counties that didn't have deer, they were closed to, to all deer hunting. Um, the counties that were open um, for, at least from 1925 to 1931, it was alternate closed seasons. So one year would be open, one year would be closed. Until 1931 was the last statewide closed season. But even in the closed counties, they were just closed, period. There was no hunting in those closed counties. And 1932 was the peak of the number of closed counties, and that was um, 50 closed counties in 1932. Um, the other thing that the state did really heavily was establish refuge areas. Um, they would buy private land for refuges, or they would designate public lands as refuges where there was no um, deer hunting allowed. Um, also, the, the regulations um, went to buck, this is when we really first started seeing buck only, or antlered buck only, where a buck, a legal deer was just a buck that had to have at least, um, had to be at least a fork. Um, so we have regulations that limited um, the amount of deer and type of deer you could kill, plus a lot of these save the deer type things. So the effect was deer populations began to grow across the state. Um, this just kind of shows even in the, the depression, people were still coming up to hunt deer. It's a quote from the New North, which was a Ryan Lander newspaper. So by 1929, we see deer in southern was or in central and a little bit in southern Wisconsin again. Um, so deer population was increasing. The, these estimates were just based on what the, the wardens would count at the train stations. Um, so how accurate they are, we don't know, but at least it shows you know, where the, the main deer harvest was. And then kind of this, at the same time, this is just a little sidebar, but um, Wisconsin was a leader in bow hunting, establishing a regulated bow season. And this is a famous picture of Roy Case with a, a little spike buck he shot with a bow in Vilas County. And it's attributed as being the first deer shot during, shot in the, the country with a bow during a licensed or regulated bow season. Um, and that was 1930, the archery was allowed for the first time during the gun hunt. And Roy Case and Aldo Leopold and two or three other people were really instrumental in pushing for a bow hunt. And they, they did this successfully and got their own, got a separate bow season by 1934, which was held in Columbia and Sauk counties because in those counties, deer were coming back to a degree where they were, um, farmers were complaining about deer damage to their crops. So it kind of shows the, the increase in deer getting into to conflicts already. But that's why they chose Columbia and Sauk counties. And then this group of bow hunters really pushed for a, a longer season. And in 1937, they got a 20 day early season. So it was completely outside of the, the gun season. So Wisconsin's kind of um, famous for this, for bow hunting. Um, so this kind of brings us up into the 1930s and 40s, and, and the deer wars are, are kind of famous. Um, it's another um, milestone or turning point in, in the history of deer hunting in Wisconsin, and, 
It's important because a lot of um, hunting regulations and hunting strategies changed here in, in the 1930s. Aldo Leopold and Ernie Swift, Aldo Leopold was, he's credited as being the first professor of wildlife management. Um, he was a professor at UW, and Ernie Swift was the head of the conservation department. And they were kind of forward-thinking people, and they, um, they thought that the, the northern deer herd was out of whack with the habitat, that the, the habitat by now was, or the population was exceeding what the habitat could support, at least in the north. And this was the first beginnings of scientific deer management, um, where they were looking at habitat, that the relationship between habitat and deer numbers. And there was a, a famous um, survey done of deer yards, and this was a summary um, from Paula Leopold's report. I think he was the head of the committee. Um, he talks about how the, the herd has been increasing because of the, the Save the Deer measures, reaching a peak about 1942, and they saw a lot of starvation in the deer yards. Um, they had the conservation committee with them. They showed the, the committee what was happening. Um, the, the northern range was, was just being stripped of its its habitat, it was vegetation. Um, and what this led to, um, Swift and, and Leopold were pushing for an antlerless deer harvest to balance the herd, balance the sex ratio. And he finally did get one. 19, the 1943 um, season was kind of famous as the split season where they had a can't remember the specifics, four or five day season for does, followed by a four or five day season for bucks, or it could have been the other way around. But they, they, um, they did get to shoot 50,000, or harvest 50,000 does during that split season, and there was so much public outcry because of that, um, that we're slaughtering the deer. Um, it went off the table for a few more years. Um, this was 1947, and I don't think it came back until um, they, they decided these open seasons like this was not going to work, so they, this is kind of the development of the, the antlerless deer quota that we're familiar with today, and then the issuance of Hunter's Choice, everybody may remember Hunter's Choice where you had to... Um, you got one party tag. Um, where's that? It's Hunter's Choice. With the party tag party first. Tag, yeah. Party tag. It was, what was it called that, right? Yeah. So Hunter's Choice was later. That was probably 50s or 60s, maybe. But yeah, the party tag was one deer per four people. Um, they had to wear the armband. Um, so it, it, the the harvest of antlers deer became more acceptable as it was more regulated with the quota system. Um, even during the war years, World War II, um, people came up north to hunt. The rationing of gasoline and ammunition was, was pretty strict. Um, I read newspaper articles about how the, um, the agency that regulated that, I can't remember the, the acronym for it, but they threatened um, deer hunters with arrest if they found out that they were you know, over their quota for, for either ammunition or gasoline. Um, but still there's a, you know, this is the deer, um, or this is the, the license um, numbers for those years. Um, quite a bit for the split season. Um, it shows people in Madison standing in line for ration ammo. Um, but after the war, um, this is when hunter numbers really began to surge. Um, the war generation came back um, home and there was a real thirst, a real desire for outdoor activities. Um, deer hunting was one of them, but we also see a, a huge increase in, in boating. Um, this was you know, big years for outboards, for, for Evinrude, and a lot of things, um, outdoor related, um, really became popular after the, the war. So you can see the hunter numbers and the license numbers really surged from 1945 
1950 or 300, passing 300,000 for the first time by the end of the, that decade. Um, and, and this, too, the, um, after the war was another big resurgence or really big um, push for deer camps. Um, a lot of deer camps were established in the, the 50s and 60s and 70s. And a lot of new traditions, um, things like deer contests and um, hunter widow balls and um, <laughs> things like that, you know, really started about this time. And it was, of course, a lot easier. You know, the first growth of the deer camps at the turn of the century was, was a pretty tough thing, but now you could drive, you know, up anywhere you wanted to. And um, just the, the increased... Um, desire to be in the woods, you know, really um, pumped up the, the deer culture in Wisconsin at this time. Um, this is about when we see the, the nine day season tradition being um, kind of enshrined. Um, the first nine day season was in 1941, but it kind of went back and forth um, for a little bit there. Um, and every so often there was a 16 day season the, the 1990-91 16-day season was a reaction to really high deer populations and thinking that we can't manage the deer populations with a nine-day season in the north. Um, but since 1955, there's been, I'm not sure, probably this last year, so there's probably been 58 consecutive nine-day deer seasons since 1955. And a lot of times, every time there's kind of a re-examination re of deer management in the state like there was with, um, you know, just recently with Dr. Deer and the, his deer committee. And um, the one thing that stays pretty solid is the nine-day season. And it's just part of deer hunting in Wisconsin. It's the you know, opening day, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, is just um, something that I don't think will ever change. There's been a lot of proposals to, to change it around, to have you know, some states will have three different seasons, and you get to pick what season you want to hunt. Um, Minnesota does that. Um, Michigan has always had a 16-day season, two-week season. Um, but nine days is the thing in Wisconsin. Um, so deer hunter numbers continue to climb, kind of zipping along pretty fast here now. But um, we reached the peak in the 1990s, and that's when we had... Um, DNR was estimating we had a deer herd of almost 2 million, and um, a result of habitat, a result of um, mild winters, um, all sorts of things may have added to that, but we did have a, a really big deer population, and um, a lot of hunters took advantage of it. Um, I think we didn't break 700,000, I think it was like 698,000 in, in 1990, um, but that was the peak of, of hunter numbers, and since then it's backed off a little bit, but not completely. Um, I don't know if my next slide covers oh, back. Um, the one thing I should have a slide for this, but to point out is, you know, in the 1970s we had a lot of anti-hunting um, attitudes, perspectives develop anti-fur, anti-animal use, and a lot of people predicted the demise, the end of um, deer hunting, or hunting in general. And um, that was in the 70s, there were a lot of surveys done, and a lot, some people, and even people in Wisconsin, like the EW, Madison, predicted that there would be no deer hunting by now, by you know, 50 years later. Um, and, like I said, we back off a little bit, but we're still at about maybe an average of 650,000 hunters um, by licenses a year, which is still a pretty big amount um, of activity. Um, there have been some changes. Um, I, I have a chapter in the book about CWD, and it's, I'm not going to go into it too much here, just to, to note that that did kind of raise its head on the scene. Um, first deer shot that tested for positive for CWD was in the 2001 gun season. 
but the state didn't announce it. They didn't get the test results back until spring of 2002. It was one deer near Mount Horeb tested positive, and then there's all sorts of things that happen with the CWD management. Um, I think I have it covered pretty well in that chapter, though. But um, again, the book ends in 2008, so if it ever gets reprinted, I'll maybe update it because we have had a ton of changes since then. Um, you know, we had two million deer in the state in the early 90s. Um, you could get all the, the antlerless tags you wanted to, at least during some seasons, bonus tags. Um, we saw at that time the, 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 the beginning of earn a buck, which was never very popular with most hunters. But now the pendulum's kind of swung backwards, which is always what happens in Wisconsin deer management. It's, it's never, you know, I could say nobody's ever really happy with it, but it, it never stays the same too. So if you just you know, hopefully wait long enough and it'll come back um, to where you want it to be. But um, after about the season of 2008, um, there's a real concern, especially in the north, about low deer numbers, that maybe that, you know, the, the pendulum to um, reducing deer numbers went too far and um, the herd um, suffered as a result. And always in the north, winters have a big deal, or a big, a lot to do with, with deer numbers. Whether it's severe winters, back-to-back -back severe winters, really impact the population. So anyway, it was pretty much accepted that we had low deer numbers. Um, Governor Walker kind of ran, um, had a platform, or a, a plank in his platform that he was going to assess the, the deer situation, deer management situation in Wisconsin, and he did just that. And what came out of that, um, for better or for worse, depending on your perspective, um, was a, a huge change to deer management or how the state manages deer. Um, and part of it, just as an example, was the County Deer Advisory Council, which um, was established that actually um, has a hand in setting um, the, the quota deer, the number of antlerless deer being taken in a county. We got away from the 70 something or more than that, 100 something of little deer management zones, and now deer management zones are county by county. Um, there's some benefits to that and some downside to that too. But I, I don't cover that in the book. It's just an example of um, the ever changing um, deer management in Wisconsin, the ever changing deer hunting scene. But kind of to finish up, I guess regardless of, of the conflict or all the, the history of deer hunting, it's still one of the state's most enduring institutions. And this photo is really outdated. This, um, her grandfather sent me this photo maybe a couple of years after the book came out, so about 2010. But Brittany Falk is shown with her first deer taken out of a deer camp that began by her great-grandfather, Emil Falk. And it's a really great story, and I have a lot of photos in the book about this deer camp called Crooked Horn Camp, which is up by Manaqua and still in existence today. Um, I think Louis Falk, who, um, who I got this information from, I think he's passed away now. But, but the story here is that um, his, Louis' grandfather, Emil, was a farmer in Columbia County, just on a whim, after the, the threshing was done um, for the, the summer, for the fall, they decided they were going to hop in a, a truck and drive up to a, the north and hunt deer, four or five farmers from Columbia County. And they did that. They, they made a um, kind of little camp on balsam boughs that had a piece of canvas over their heads, and, and that was their first camp. And it had been in has been in existence every year since then. And it was the 1930s when that happened. So the reason I have her picture here is some of the bright spots of hunting and hunting tradition in Wisconsin is that some demographics, some segments of the population are increasing their interest and their participation in um, deer hunting. And um, younger people um, are being mentored better um, there's more opportunities for younger people to get into um, deer hunting, and there's more opportunities for females 
either females as young as Brittany is in this photo, and adult females. And I don't have a slide for this, but I, I mentioned in the book where the, um, um, the Becoming an Outdoors Woman, Outdoors Woman program has gotten to be really popular. It started um, here in Wisconsin at UWSP. Um, Dr. Chris Thomas, who's the head of the, the College of Natural Resources there now, had a lot to do with starting it. And she started it because they had a conference on, um, on women in, in, in hunting, or hunting and fishing. And they had a survey, they had survey results that asked, why don't more women get involved with, with hunting or fishing? And the answer they got back, the number one answer is they don't know how. They don't know how to hunt or they don't know how to fish. So Becoming an Outdoors Woman program was set up to have these workshops that taught women how to shoot a gun, um, how to fly fish, just all sorts of things. And that's credited with bringing a lot of women into the, the hunting community. And the other thing too with, with um, kids is there used to be kind of a stigma, you know, get, about having your daughter at deer camp. That didn't happen very often. And I mentioned this in the book too. There were plenty of women that hunted even back in the 1800s. Um, and when they were successful, it'd be front page news. Um, but it was, I guess, rare. It wasn't um, unknown, but it was rare. And you know, through the decades, the little girls, people used to have bigger families where you know the boys got the attention from the dad for hunting. They were the ones that got mentored. Well, now we have smaller families, or maybe you just have a daughter, or maybe you have two daughters. Um, so girls are being mentored more. There's more programs for, for girls, um, more attention in schools, um, and things like that. So that's, that's a growing demographic, and it's a positive sign um, for deer hunting that we can reverse the trend. Um, where kind of the demographics 10 years ago used to be um, the average deer hunter in Wisconsin was a middle-aged white male, um, like a lot of us, and that um, is changing because that demographic is not going to sustain deer hunting. Um, so, kind of to wrap things up, you know, deer hunting in Wisconsin is a big deal. It's important to every community in the state. Um, economically, but also in, in many other ways. And I guess what I realized from writing this book is there's a reason for that. And it does go back 10,000 years of a continuous deer hunting um, culture in this region of the country. And it's the reason I, I spent so much time talking about the whitetail. Um, that's one component. The, the animal itself is um, as such a challenge to hunt. It's such a you know beautiful animal to see, and it, you know without having that animal and and the reason why it's it's so challenging to hunt, um, the hunt wouldn't be the same. A lot of people think that North American, especially um, Great Lakes state deer hunting, is some of the best big game hunting in the country. Um, the history that goes along with our hunt, you know, the, the history with bow hunting and um, the deer camp history, the camaraderie with, with uh, getting together for nine days or Thanksgiving, the week of Thanksgiving, that's a big component. And just the Wisconsin landscape itself, the, the rolling farm lands um, and, and woodlots of, of central and southern Wisconsin and the, the big woods of northern Wisconsin and the, the swamps and it's just um, a combination of so many different things that make it so unique that there's really nothing like it anywhere, I don't think. Um, so that's, I guess, the, the wrap up to why this, or why deer hunting is such a big deal in Wisconsin. So, so uh, yeah. you talked about the women hunting and that education thing. I guess my question is, are there women groups that go up, and just women, and go up for out hunting? I don't know. There might be. I've, I've never seen like an organized 
Drew Hunt. You know, I would guess that um, there's probably some bonds or, you know, friendships made at the Becoming an Outdoor Women's camps where, you know, two or three um, attendees get together. But, yeah, it's a good question. Where is that, where can I sign up for that, the, the outdoor women thing? Um, Wisconsin usually has a couple each year, and other states have them, and I think it's become a national organization. So if you were to go on a computer and find, just look for Becoming an Outdoors Woman programs, mm -hmm. um, you would probably find where there's some close by. Anything, any other questions? Or, um, just gonna wrap up with some, some of you may have seen this, the other book I have. And I have music to this. When I was writing for Wisconsin Outdoor News, I wrote a lot of, um, I had a column called History of Field, and all the deer hunting ones became part of the book, as well as those first 10 um, chapters that I talked about. But I did a lot of writing about other outdoor history type things in Wisconsin, like wooden boats and the presidents that came to Wisconsin to, to fish on the Brule River. And we have just a really amazing history of hunting and fishing in the state. So we took a lot of those um, columns and put them into this book, um, History of Field, that I have here. Um, and I think the, the outdoor history has been missed by a lot of people. A lot of historians don't really focus on it. Um, oops. oops, yeah. Um, so I, I have both books for sale and I have about a 10% discount on them for tonight. So if anybody is interested, I appreciate um, you all who bought books already. And any final question? Question. Uh, CWD? Yeah. Is that still going on? Yeah. Um, well, they, the latest thing is they found a CWD positive deer in Oneida County, just about two miles away from where I hunt, that was inside the deer farm, a hunting preserve. Um, so that, the, the impact of that shut down baiting in Oneida, Vilas, and Forest County, because they, they shut down all the, the adjacent counties. So brings almost to, I think, like 50 counties that were baiting is illegal because of CWD. And two or three years ago, they found a CWD deer. Oh, I think this was a wild deer, positive, over by Cumberland, Marin County, or I can't remember exactly what counties, but that um, kind of northwest part of the state. What does baiting have to do with CWD? The scientists feel it's transmitted um, deer to deer transmission. Through the spit. Yeah. So baiting um, okay, brings deer together and <coughs> might increase the, the possibility of transmission. Okay. All right, well, thanks. Or, did you have a question? No, I was just going to mention you didn't mention anything about the uh, night. The deer, the Indians get the uh, hunt nights, Menominee's. Yeah, and it just did that. And then the other thing was, I don't know, you didn't really get into it was uh, when we start talking about CW, there's other a lot of other bone issues. They found a lot of uh, deer out in more like like in the marsh, pork and marsh oh, in that yeah. area, where their their feet got uh, deformed and stuff. Oh, okay. You know, was that related to CWD or? Not really, no. They don't, some other another bone, another bone disease, but not, disease. not like CWD. Yeah, and one thing I do cover in the book a little bit for that that time period is the um, when the treaty rights were first reaffirmed, and there's a lot of conflict yeah. there. I cover that to a little degree in there. So, well, I'll be sticking around for a little bit if you have questions afterwards while I pack up and thanks for coming down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.